Hello, welcome to English Country Life. Welcome to the kitchen. Today we're going to make an ingredient that we use for all sorts of useful things and that ingredient is lard. We use it for everything from making sustainable soap so much better for the environment than that palm oil rubbish. We use it in making dubbing to protect our boots. It's a great ingredient in leather care. We use it in making pastry. We use it for frying. The list goes on. It's a superb, healthy, useful, sustainable product. And it's one that we use a lot of. Now, lard is basically rendered pig fat. And the very best lard comes from this, which is called leaf fat. And it comes from around the kidney area of a pig. The process of turning that leaf fat into lard is very simple. We cut it into small pieces. We melt it in the presence of just a little bit of water, which will boil off during the process. We scoop off any bits of pig meat, etc., that are left adhering to the fat. We pour it for a filter, and then we set it in an appropriate storage container. That's it. That's all there is to it. So let's get on and have a look and see how we do that. This is a close-up of leaf fat. As you can see, it comes in big sheets. And honestly, those big sheets are hard to melt. So we need to get it into smaller pieces. This is very similar when you think of the way we talk about beeswax, for example. Pelleted or grated beeswax, much easier to melt than big slabs. Same holds true of our leaf fat. If you're buying leaf fat from the butcher, ask them to grind it for you in a great big mincer that they'll have. So much easier. We don't have one. So let's look at how we do it. Your leaf fat will probably come folded up. Before cutting, unfold it all. You may find in areas there are small pieces of meat adhering to it. Take those off because our process of rendering is actually to remove anything like that. My technique with big sheets is usually to cut it into one inch strips and then cross cut those strips in a stack. It's just quicker that way. And you get a lot of small pieces very quickly. The process of preparing your leaf fat for rendering is pretty much just cut it up into small pieces. And by small, half an inch, one centimeter. Don't pack it together after that. Keep it loose with some air gaps because we're going to want water and melted fat to circulate around it. Pop it into a bowl. Be aware your hands, the board, the knife get greasy with this stuff. So occasionally you may need to clean your hands and your knife so you don't slip when cutting. And that's what we're looking for as we're chopping up our leaf fat. Relatively small pieces. Any big bits of flesh or connective tissue removed. So what we've got is roughly chopped fat with a few little bits of meat still adhering to it. Now when you're doing a job like this in decent quantity one thing you are going to realize quickly is get knives with what I would call decent ergonomics. Rounded handles. You get things like the square sabatier knives, which I have some of and they work fine, but for protracted chopping you're going to give yourself blisters. So when you're choosing your kitchen knives, find some that are comfortable to hold, comfortable to press with when holding that handle, and comfortable to work with for long periods. To begin our process of rendering, I don't want the fat to stick to the bottom of the pan and burn. So I've put just a little bit of water in the bottom of this pan, just enough to cover the base of the pan. And into that, I'm going to loosely put a little, and I do mean a little, of our chopped up leaf fat. And we'll let that begin to melt. And as that begins to melt, the liquid level will rise. And we turn the gas right down I don't want to burn this fat. That's what I'm trying to do. If you burn the fat, it will affect the flavour. If you look carefully now, 
what you can see here, he said pointing with his spoon, the little globules of fat starting to form on the surface of the water. See here? And that's the fat beginning to break down in the water without burning. Very quickly you'll see larger and larger amounts of fat beginning to appear in your pan. And when you're happy that any more fat that you add isn't going to stick, you can add a bit more of your leaf fat and ensure that you've got a good coverage on the base of the pan. As you stir this now, after a few more minutes, you can see there's a really good layer of melted fat in the bottom of the pan. And also, if you look closely, you'll see each of the pieces of leaf fat are sort of glistening, partly from their own fat melting, partly from being coated with the melted fat in the bottom of the pan. And that's telling us it's safe now to add the rest of our finely chopped leaf fat, bring it all up to temperature and ever so gently melt it. With three quarters of an hour into the rendering now, and as you can see, it hasn't melted yet, but the liquid is higher and the lumps are smaller. If you get your temperature too high, your lard will go brown, which isn't the end of the world, but it may take on a bit of a stronger taste. And uh, certainly, as I say, it will colour. So we're going as gently as this cooker will permit us. We are a couple of hours into the cooking process now. What you can see here is that some of the material has started to cook and go golden brown. And that, in effect, is being deep fried in lard. But that tells us a couple of things. It tells us that if we keep going, we're going to overcook our rendered lard. And it tells us that whatever this is, it's not lard. Because if it was lard, it would have melted. So we need to use the slotted spoon to remove that before we continue with the process. You're going to come to a point where you've got fine material that's very hard to remove with a slotted spoon. The easiest way of getting rid of that is to run the whole lot through a sieve. This is a traditional coarse sieve and it won't catch everything that we need to catch when rendering lard, the finer particles, but if we just pop a bit of cheesecloth or muslin over the top you may be quite surprised at how easily the liquid passes through it but the particles are caught and um, when I started doing this, I thought that the fat would set up very quickly at room temperature and sort of leave a claggy mess on cloth and sieves and the like. But as you can see here and from the little particles we've caught, that isn't the case. And the filtered lard underneath looks absolutely great. This is a small version, as you can see, of the clip top jar. But that makes for a jar that you won't be digging at for months on end, but perfect for a bit of pastry, a little bit of frying, those kind of tasks. This jam funnel, you've seen similar ones appear all over our videos, so useful. And then we just take our melted lard. Pour. Don't fill right to the very top. And that's a jar of fresh lard. We'll look at it again when it's cooled. These are our bar moulds. Ever so useful. 
you do need a steady hand here. And that's how we render log. We've ended up with a couple of jars. Keep those in the fridge and they'll get used for pastry and for frying and day-to-day -day cooking activities. We've got a load of bars of lard as well. You're going to see those in some future videos in perhaps in some ways you might not expect. You can use lard from anything from seasoning cast iron to making dubbing for your boots. And there's a delicious byproduct and bearing in mind that lard is a byproduct so perhaps this is a byproduct of a byproduct. The parts that we scooped out have been roasted with some sea salt to make delicious homemade pork scratchings. If this is the sort of thing you like, let us know in the comments, please. It really makes a difference when people leave a comment. Give us a thumbs up if it's been useful but you don't want to comment and please do that now. Hit the subscribe button if you want to hear more from us. That's it. I'm going to get the grease proof paper out, wrap up my bars of lard and uh, you come back and see us soon. We'd love to see you. Take care.